what's your take on the attack of Israelis in the Al Shifa hospital? Do we have any information that Hamas was using these hospitals to facilitate their operation against Israelis? Uh, no, this <clears throat> this was the Israeli equivalent of Geraldo Rivera opening Al Capone's vault. You know, they had an entire television show devoted for it, hour, two hours, and finally they opened it up and there's nothing there. And that's what uh, Israel discovered at Al Shifa. There was nothing there. Uh, and in fact, it, there's certain uh, strong uh, circumstantial evidence that Israel planted evidence trying to implicate that this was a Hamas operating center. It wasn't. And and there, you know, they've got several indicators. If there's a one of the Israeli soldiers who's speaking in English, by the way, is giving a tour, and they've got two different uh, two different pieces of film footage next to the MRI machine, where he points down. The first one he does, you can see there's like foam around uh, an AK-47 and an AK-47 magazine. Then he comes back to put out a new film and he points down there where the foam's gone. There are two, there are now two AK-47, you know, so they, they keep moving stuff around. And in the background, you can see this box. Well, the box has the same label on the bottom that these uh, Israelis showed up out in front of the hospital with these boxes labeled medical supplies. And I've made the point in other places that the last I checked, the Israeli language is Hebrew, not English. So why do you label boxes that are from Israel in English as opposed to Hebrew? Well, because you're selling a story to an American audience that speaks English. And those boxes were used to carry incriminating material into the hospital so they could plant it to dress it up uh, to look like this had been a big Hamas headquarters. They really, they came away with nothing on that. They had a similar sort of uh, embarrassment at the Rantisi Children's Hospital. So, you know, Israel, they made the mistake. They built it up as this big thing. And then when they got in there, there was nothing. And, oh yeah, one other point. Uh, Israel built the underground bunkers back in 1983 in that hospital. This was not built by Hamas. This was built by Israel. That's why Israel could speak with such confidence that there was this facility down there because Israel built it. If that's the case, why they're doing this? What's the goal behind attacking these hospitals? Well, you destroy the hospitals, you eliminate the ability of people to continue to live in that area. And so if, the, if there are no hospitals, you can't, no place for babies to be born, no places for people to be treated who are sick or injured. Um I think it's part of an overall Israeli strategy to vacate, to force all 2.5 million Gazans out of the Gaza Strip. Uh, it's, you know, it's it's a war crime, what they're doing. When the Netanyahu administration would say that this is the final point for us. Well, I, that's the Israeli goal, to get all of the Gazans out. Vacate the land so Israel can take it over. Uh, that is uh, the ultimate Israeli plan here. What remains to be seen is how much of a fight Hamas can put up. So far, it looks like Israel has not been going into the heart of the Hamas strength in the Gaza Strip. And initially, Israel told uh, the Israeli Defense Force, warned the, the Palestinians, flee to the south, flee to the south. Well, now, now they're telling them to get out of the south. Well, Egypt's not going to let them in. Egypt, uh, you know, they understand that if they let them in, uh, then it's going to be Egypt's forever. Uh, the, you know, they will not be going elsewhere. So uh, there's still a, a lot of dynamics at, at play here that um, Israel doesn't fully control. How do you see the Biden administration? Are they going to force <clears throat> the Netanyahu administration or are they going to go along with this plan that is already carrying out in Gaza? Because it seems to me that at the end of the day, nobody can force them but the Biden administration. Well, uh, but the Biden team, are they're trying to have it both ways. They're trying to remain strong, supporting Israel, but also now want to make gestures to the Arab Muslim world that they support a ceasefire. But you know, the United States is in a position where they could bring Israel to heel real quick. Just say either stop this or we're cutting off all aid. But they won't do that. 
because there's there's too much political power in the United States in the hands of, of APAC and uh, the American Jewish community that will prevent Biden from doing that. Do you think that Netanyahu is getting stronger in Israel in terms no, of no. public opinion? How do you find this? Yeah, that's the that is the other sort of wild card in this whole equation that uh, Netanyahu's popularity is declining. It's not increasing. There was a, the initial rally around the prime minister in the immediate aftermath of October 7. But, you know, there have been stories coming out showing that uh, Netanyahu and his team have lied. You know, they've uh, particularly misrepresented the nature of uh, the so-called atrocities committed by Hamas, such as beheading 40 babies. That never happened. Raping women. No credible evidence of that either. Uh, so, uh, and then the hostages remain uh, in uh, under the control of Hamas, and the the relatives of those hostages are coming out with greater anger directed at Netanyahu for not doing enough to get them free. Do you see any possibility of having a false flag attack in that yeah. region? I, I think the chances of that are diminishing, not increasing. Um, Hezbollah has been stepping up its campaign against northern uh, Israel. And Netanyahu's been pretty, uh, he's talked tough about, you know, punishing Lebanon, punishing Hezbollah. But the, despite the tough talk, he's not following it up with action because they recognize if they escalate it to a point that they draw in Hezbollah, then that increases the chance that Iran gets involved and maybe even Turkey. And Israel is not in a position to handle, um, you know, Iran and Hezbollah without U.S. military assistance. It seems to me that Turkey right now is more radical to Israel than Iran. How Erdogan, you... Erdogan's, yeah, he's much more vocal anyway. But, you know, the, old, the, the expression in the United States, talk is cheap. He's talking, but what, what he could... There's things he could do, such as he could stop shipping oil to Israel. He's not doing that. So as I say, you just you listen to the talk, but watch watch the action. What are they really doing? How do you see the international community in the aftermath of these events that are happening right now in Gaza? Well, so far, in terms of be, uh, speaking out and protests, this is probably the most unified we've ever seen the Arab and Muslim world in the history of Israel's existence to speak out and condemn Israel. So Israel really is facing uh, some significant diplomatic isolation in a way that it never has uh, previously. <clears throat> that said, there are still countries like Saudi Arabia and Egypt that are, you know, they're not following the fiery rhetoric of an Erdogan. And so they're being much more cautious uh, leaving, I think, some room open maybe for some negotiations. The, you know, the, the Palestinians are not going to go away. Israel's not going to be able to kill them all. And the lingering resentment caused by what Israel has done during this uh, retaliatory strike in response to October 7 is going to linger on. So I think the chance for future revenge killings and Revenge terrorism, if you want to call it that, is pretty high. So this is, you know, the this is not going to settle the chaos. The only thing that would come close to, you know, separating the two sides is if there really was uh, a Palestinian state set up that Israel was not in control of. You talk about negotiations. How these negotiations should be carried out? Is Hamas part of these negotiations? Who's going to negotiate with Israelis? Well, there are negotiations underway right now, I understand, in Qatar between uh, the Hamas leadership and Mossad. And they're you know, working out a deal to release hostages and, and, and prisoners, Israeli uh, Palestinians in Israeli prisons, and then... Israelis and, and other foreigners that are held hostage right now by Hamas. Who has the upper hand among Palestinians, Mahmoud Abbas or Hamas, or none of them? I would say at this point, Hamas probably has more strength than uh, Mahmoud Abbas, because Abbas is 
I think Abbas is seen as a weak leader, and he has not done a lot to staunch uh, the, the deaths, the murders, if you will, of the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. What would be the solution to this conflict? Is Palestine capable of being a state with its current situation? It is more possible now than it would have been two, three years ago, simply because you've got now most of the world paying attention to it and talking about it. But it's, you know, implementing it, it's not going to be easy at all. And uh, you've got extremist factions, both in Israel and within the Palestinians, within Hamas, that will fight and oppose that. Uh, they each have a very uncompromising view that uh, they're the only ones that should be in control of that territory. And, and everybody else, you know, from, from the Jewish, uh, the, you know, the ultra extremists there, they want to get rid of, Christi of Christians and Muslims. And for the Hamas types, they want to get rid of Jews and Christians. So, you know, there's no, no logic, there's no reasonable way to bridge that ideological gap. It's going to take time, time and money. They've got, you know, they've got the human capital quite amply supplied, even despite the, the death toll and the number that have been wounded in the Israeli strikes. But um, bringing, you know, the bridging the gulf, even within the Palestinian community, because it's not all Muslim either. There are Christians within the Palestinian community, uh, Orthodox Christians. So, they've, you know, there are a lot of political compromises that are going to have to be made. And uh, that can only be done through negotiation. And Hamas, if you've ever read its charter, they're not known for being negoti you know, negotiators or conciliators. They have a strong belief and it's, this is what we believe, and you'll follow it or else. And, you know, you find that same sort of um, theological point of view within Christianity and within Judaism, too. Not here to suggest that, that uh, Hamas is the only one with a radical uh, view of, about not con making, uh, you know, concessions to anyone. You, you find the same thing. In fact, I posted a a video last night at sonar21.com of this one Tennessee pastor, but he's basically calling for blowing up the Dome of the Rock and that all Muslims are Satanists. And, you know, it's just, you know, it's the came, it's a Christian saying in Christian jargon what Americans, you know, hear when they listen to some Iranian preachers, just that kind of vitriol. And hatred doesn't it doesn't play well. Is Hamas winning politically? Is Hamas losing? Hamas is losing militarily, not dramatically so yet, but losing militarily. They're outgunned. They don't have uh, aircraft. They don't have tanks. Uh, they don't have uh, these large vehicles that can move, and they don't have a independent reserve of fuel, much less ammunition. But they have been very effective on the PR side, and they have been winning the PR war to the point that Israel has become increasingly isolated. And you've got more countries now that are breaking relations with uh, Israel than you ever have had in the past. So this, you know, Israel thinks it can kill its way out of this, but they can't. Um, the more the, the more the killing that they do, in particular of uh, women and children, the worse it's going to get for them politically, and the greater the pressure from the international community, which ultimately could lead to them being isolated, having their oil cut off. Uh, that that would not be a good thing for Israel. There is a war going on in Avdivka. How does it look like? Is it a new Bakhmut? It's worse than Bakhmut in terms of the strategic implications for Ukraine. It is identified as a, sort of the linchpin of the Ukrainian defensive line in the, in the Donetsk, and that if Avdivka falls, then the rest of that defense line in and around Donetsk the city is going to collapse. And when, once it collapses, Ukraine's really only option is retreat westward to the Dnieper River and get on the other side of the river.
Do we understand what would be the policy right now with all those changes with what we're seeing in Avdivka? I, I don't think the United States has a lot of leverage to coerce negotiations with Russia. And I think Russia right now is of no mind or mood to negotiate with the United States anything but a U.S. surrender, a Ukrainian surrender as well. Um, I mean, Russia's done well up to this point, and they're, um, you know, they're winning on the battlefield. The, right now, you know, the Biden administration is not in a position to even send more funding. In fact, yesterday, the uh, this uh, Pritzker who has been named as an envoy by Biden to Ukraine, she she asked Zelensky straight up, uh, so how long do you, you know, if we if we can't give you any more aid, how long do you think you guys can survive? And Zelensky's like, oh my God, what, what are you talking about? So, you know, the United States is not in a position to continue to pour money into Ukraine. Uh, when it comes to sending weapon systems, Israel gets first bid, not Ukraine. And uh, then on the battlefield, Russia is steadily moving and killing Ukrainian forces in large numbers. It's just, it's just, I, again, it's a matter of time. They've lost, they're dead, they just don't know it yet. How do you see the support for the Ukraine war in Europe? Is Washington capable of pressuring Europe for sending more funds to Ukraine? Europe is is starting to fragment as well. The one, the one country that's been more firm and saying it's going to continue to support is Germany. That's sort of a surprise. The German economy is not doing that well, so it we'll, we'll, remains to be seen whether they can truly deliver on that promise. But um, you're, you're seeing signs that the support for Ukraine is starting to fray. And, and we talked about this a little last week with respect to the Economist article that uh, featured Zaluzhny because, you know, that signals at least that the British UK are seeing Zaluzhny as a more likely uh, better replacement uh, than Zelensky as president. We know that in Europe, the UK was so much supporting of Ukraine. Right, right. now, how do you see their policy? Do you think that their policy in Ukraine has changed? Not, no, not entirely, but they, they don't have a lot to give, you know. They're like the, the, the Beatles song, I've given all I've got to give. Yeah, they, well, that's that's what Britain has done. They don't have more tanks, more artillery shells, more artillery pieces, more cru storm shadow cruise missiles to give them. They're, they're tapped out. And they don't have the industrial base either anymore in the United Kingdom to make up for what they've given away. So they're, the Brits are in a tough position. They were talking about opening new factories for weapons in Ukraine. Do you think that plan is possible? No. No. Any, any, any factory of any kind that's actually producing military equipment, Russia is going to hit it and destroy it. Uh, you know, I think that they may be betting on uh, or sort of hoping that the United Kingdom could build some factories and get those going. But, you know, Ukraine doesn't have the, even access to the natural resources that it once did, because a lot of the, what it would need to produce those weapon systems are under the control of Russia in uh, eastern uh, Donbass. Now they're talking about Ukraine joining the EU. Is that possible for the European Union to take it? No. I mean, there's, it's true. They're saying that now, but there's, a, there's, there's no way that Ukraine would get admitted to the EU. You know, number one, its agricultural sector, what's left of it, poses a threat to the farmers in places like Poland, Czech Republic, Slovak Republic, you know, the, I think Belgium. So, you know, they're not going to, the EU is, would just be creating a major political and economic problem for itself if it allows the Ukraine in. I think they're just trying to keep them happy for now, tell them what they want to hear. Uh, so that you can lull, lull them into complacency before they decide to drop Zelensky off a cliff. Because I think that's where it's headed. Uh, I don't. I don't think he will physically survive. I don't mean just um, metaphorically survive, but I. I don't think he's going to physically survive. Um, if, if let me put it this way, if he loves to see the new year, he's a lucky man.
with all the experiences that we had during this war in Ukraine and now this conflict in Israel, do you think that it would be a good lesson for the U.S. foreign policy to go along with China and make some negotiations on the conflict in Taiwan instead of going and fighting China? Well, yeah, the, I think you saw the summit that took place yesterday, day before yesterday. <clears throat> this is the United States, I think, trying to repair the damage that has been done to relations with China simply because the United States knows it cannot handle a crisis with Israel and Palestine, a crisis with Ukraine and Russia, and then a crisis with China and Taiwan. The United States is not equipped to deal with uh, it, really any of those, much less all three at once. You know, Biden... Um, he can't help himself because he's not mentally there, for starters. After after the meeting with Xi, which was cordial, but uh, you know the Chinese weren't backing away and saying, "Oh, yeah, we're going to uh, give in to everything the United States wants." Uh, Biden then goes out to a press conference later and calls Xi a dictator, which you know forced the Chinese to react again and basically. Uh, condemn what the United States president was saying. So, it, you know, Biden's not in control of himself. That's quite evident. Mm -hmm.